black people think it's cute to have their kids cussing them out. Black people think it's cute to run up to their little kids and say, I, I got to fight. I need you to come fight with me. Black people think it's cute to have their kids with guns and all these other things, just being real ratchet all over. We think that's cute. And then when the kids grow up and you can't handle the kids, now you're mad, but you taught them to behave that way. We're teaching the kids to behave that way. Why? Because we was taught to behave that way. Messed up culture keep getting passed down. It's Friday, and welcome to On the Shoulders of Giants. Since it's Friday, you already know what it is. Joseph Ward here, Professor Carl Tone Jones, Patrick Irvin, Breakdown Friday, where we take the information from our master teachers, our scholars, our leaders, our educators, and we look at the information, we understand the information, we make sure we break down the information even further for further understanding that way we can use the information to get practical tangible results from the information rather than rather than just gathering the information and making ourselves feel good because we know the information if we don't use it what's the point of having the information so here we are breakdown friday just trying to do our part because there are many pieces to this puzzle and we're just trying to put the pieces together and be able to use the information so what's going on fellas how y'all feeling on this good friday Hey, I'm chilling, man. You know, my bro right here, he look a little upset. I know, Pat. Why you mad, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> man, you laughing? Life, you mad? Life <laughs> ain't working right, and I'm frozen hey. like this hey. in real life. <laughs> Pat say, I am smiling. I am smiling. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <clears throat> do want to give a quick announcement. Um, remember my birthday is saturday so if y'all want to show your homeboy some love remember it's saturday anything in the description if y'all want to show me some love, just give me some shout out just show me some love on saturday because it's my birthday turning 39 so y'all make sure y'all show me some love and i appreciate all of that also if you go to my community tab i have a poll up right now i just finished the reading of dr naeem akbar's breaking the chains of psychological slavery so this week's choices are Dr. Francis Quest, Dr. Francis Cress Wells thinks ISIS papers, Dr. Amos Wilson's African Center Consciousness versus the New World Order, Dr. Joy DeGruz's Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, or Dr. Claude Anderson's Power Nomics. Go ahead and put your votes in because uh, I'm going to be re recording around Sunday, maybe Monday. So go ahead and get your votes in so you can go ahead and see uh, if your vote can influence whatever book that we read and whatever one that win that's what we're going with so you know it's up to you all so make sure you put your votes in so uh with that being said of course like i say it's breakdown friday we got we're here to do what we do so this week we have dr barbara sizemore and she's talking about cultural impacts and um what's the, what's the word um self-actualization cultural impacts and self-actualization and how it's important and why it's important and even barriers to self-actualization and cultural impacts so let's get into it here is the sum total of artifacts which any group accumulates in its struggle for survival and autonomy yeah. right then it's dynamic because it's a struggle it's not static it doesn't stand still and never change it changes with the condition, okay? Because as you try to survive and to be self-autonomous and the conditions change that keep you from doing that, you change in order to combat those conditions. Yeah. Am I making sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Stop right there. At the gate. At the gate. Yeah, because, you know, she, she dropping them. So she started off by giving a a definition of culture not the definition but a, a definition of culture and we know we talked about culture in the past and culture it, it dictates how we walk talk think act sleep defend ourselves and all these different things and she's talking about attacks on on your culture threats to your culture um things that are put in, or people who put themselves in place to change your culture to fit their benefit and when your culture is threatened, like she's saying, we have to be able to adjust to protect ourselves. Clearly, 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 we ain't been doing that. Clearly, we ain't been doing that. Especially, we could say, of, of course, we could say it longer than uh, 100 years, but especially like for the past 100 years, we have not had any, I, I'm going to use the word moats. We haven't had any moats 
around our culture, around us, period, to protect us from outside forces, i.e. white supremacy coming in to give us their cultural traits so that therefore they can dictate their culture and keep their position. So if we have culture and we're not being we're not able to protect that culture, it's gonna be difficult to self-actualize. So out the gate, that's what I'm thinking. What about what you think of PC? Well, one of the things that she brings to light early on is that if even when you're trying to get on code, if you're within or you are a subset of another person, another people's culture, mm-hmm. once they see you organizing and mobilizing, they can throw a monkey wrench in the dynamic of society and totally put you in a position where you have to fall back on your plans of independence, your plans of self-sufficiency and things of that nature, because now you have to be worried about your current situation, your current survival, you know? So it's like when uh, just not too long ago, Starbucks, the workers at Starbucks were trying to, organizing and some of the buildings some of the different stores were trying to create a union well you know starbucks had like a red cup day so people were like forget that strike i need to get in there and get this red cup special and then the people who were like protesting and going on had to go back to work because the strike didn't work they threw a monkey wrench into it. So it didn't allow them the autonomy of having a union to protect them as they saw fit. And similarly, in cultures, especially if you're talking about black people living in this country, uh, be, when people see us mobilizing and organizing and they see it as being effective, they often do they often do things, you know, this government, white supremacy, however you want to call it, often do does things to throw a monkey wrench in what we're trying to build. Uh, create different dynamics so that we have to sort of fall back off of that and move accordingly and become reactive to whatever damage they've inflicted on us. So it's a very effective strategy because it'll always keep you, um, it'll always keep you off balance. And, you know, something simple, you know, you you, you can be organizing, but now we're going to raise the, the interest rates. So now everything costs more. So what you were planning to do when you were organizing, now you have to take a back seat because now you have to fall back on survival. And like I said, it's a very effective strategy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, One of the things I wanted to highlight, now this is a perfect place to stop it, um, (laughs) is the dynamic nature that she spoke of. This is something that we've been talking about a lot over the years. And it's something that uh, those of us that are studying white supremacy need to pay more attention to. Um, white supremacy changes. It's not static. It's not, you know what I'm saying? And just black people change as well for those of us that are studying black people. And so a lot of the times what you have is uh, people in the community organization meetings or the plannings or the committees or whatever like they they'll read a history book or a history article and then they get locked in on the 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 presentation of what was uh given to them in their source of information the time period the context everything they get locked in and the ability to translate past events into what's happening now is lost you know that's a wonderful thing about what we're doing here yeah so on Consequently, you know, you have old modalities and old strategies constantly being reused, a.k.a. Yeah. the uh, the march and boycott rhetoric. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, it, it doesn't take into account the dynamics have shifted. The situation is not the same. Yes, we're still fighting the same enemy, but that enemy isn't moving the same. And we're nah. not moving the same either. Nah. So... I that's one thing that I love that you know she harped on or she jumped right into that at the early part of this clip anyways that you selected was just that piece of like we really need to get serious about updating 
uh, our understanding of what's happening. And that update has to happen on a constant basis. Like every time you change, white supremacy changes. And the changes that white supremacy makes also changes you. So the strategies that you thought up 40 years ago aren't going to work the same way now as they did 40 years ago. Now, I'm not saying they won't work at all, but you 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 more than likely are going to have to make some adjustments in order to make sure that the things you're doing are efficient. That's a, that's a real... I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. I'm just going to say evolve or die because, and I'm just going to say this real quick. Evolve or die. White, the white supremacists, they, they're supposed to do this. This is what they're supposed to do to maintain control. They're supposed to throw a monkey wrench in our plans. But we, like she's saying, we are supposed to be at a level where we can protect ourselves from the monkey wrench or even counter the monkey wrench that's being thrown in our thrown in our plans but the problem is today and to build off what pat was saying too is one of the differences white supremacy will always evolve but they, we have to be honest with ourselves and say white people don't have to move like they used to move because we're doing it for them we're doing the dirty job we're doing the job we're doing the dirty work for them we're doing it to ourselves we stay at each other's throat so yeah you're right pat you are correct white supremacy don't have to move the same way because that's what they're they're the seeds that they planted a while ago to create the Negro mindset has us on autopilot and we doing the dirty work for them. That's what I want to say. Go ahead, PC. Well, it's it's like, and I mean, yeah, you pretty much said what I was going to say. So <laughs> <laughs> I really don't need to add too much to it. It you know you 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 pretty much y'all both addressed what I was going to say in regards to um, the adaptation of, of the system and how proactive they are in keeping us off balance and predictable models of our behavior and knowing when to push us this way, knowing when to nudge us this way. And we've been perfectly trained Negroes, you know what I'm saying? So they, they don't have to do as much because they've trained us on how to police ourselves and, you know, the models from the plantation have just been adapted and readdressed and, and but it's the same, you know, it's the same format. So, you know. Yep. Yep. All right, let's move forward. Now, what is, what is, what is survival? I mean, you know, what survival means that the group has to do at, at least three things. One, the group has to see that each individual member keeps himself or herself in good enough mental, right. moral, spiritual, and physical health right. long enough to reproduce that self right. and then take care of whatever you reproduce. Right. That's the least. All right. if, you don't, if you don't do that, the group dies. It's gone. <laughs> well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we are dying. <sighs> Boy, I mean, <laughs> it's the it's the it's the current culture we have. It's destructive. It's degenerate culture. It's toxic culture. It's it's anti-black culture. It's black and anti-black at the same time. And that's the thing, like we, like I just said, we are, we have been programmed and we've brought into the program. And like she says, we've passed down negative cultural traits. We don't, we really don't like each other. Because think about, think about the mindset a group of people has to have to see somebody that looks like you in a confrontational situation and won't think twice about taking that person out, but will be in the same confrontational situation with somebody else from another group that don't look like you and will have the wherewithal to think about what they do before they do it. That's some, that's some real conditioning. Like our minds are messed up, but this is what we're passing down. Like I was, I know me and Pat uh, had the conversation before and I was just thinking today, my generation right now, we are like, the parents right now and we messing up we're not doing we're not passing down nothing good but at the same time a lot of us didn't have good things to pass it down good culture to pass down good morals to pass down good values to pass down you can't you don't get a hot girl summer if you don't have a freak me 
I'm just saying it starts somewhere. Like there's a there's a a a song from 1938 where this 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 woman is talking this real vulgar song from 1938, and not just talk about the women because we ought to know how the music the men make, but it's the programming that we have and the way we think about ourselves, the way we look at ourselves, the way we talk about ourselves, the way we feel about each other. We don't give a damn about each other. We look at each other as enemies, and that's the culture we continue to pass down. And if we it, it, it feel like it's by over because we keep gravitating to the negativity and we keep passing it down. Look at social media. Black people think it's cute to have their kids cussing them out. Black people think it's cute to run up to their little kids and say, I, I got to fight. I need you to come fight with me. Black people think it's cute to have their kids with guns and all these other things just being real ratchet all over. We think that's cute. And then when the kids grow up, and you can't handle the kids, now you're mad, but you taught them to behave that way. We're teaching the kids to behave that way. Why? Because we was taught to behave that way. Messed up culture keep getting passed down. I'm done. <laughs> you tackle it, Pat. <laughs> no, I mean, I was just, it's, so a big part of it is programming, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the, the challenges, because we can keep adding on to what uh, Joe just said, you know, I'm constantly sharing TikToks with y'all about, uh, you know, I shared one earlier where the, the mama was filming the kid spanking the daddy like hard with a belt mm -hmm. and then ran out the room as the daddy woke up to being spanked and chased the baby out the room. And in the comments, everybody making jokes. I shared a video about a... a Two little boys and they couldn't have been no more than five, six years old in the big wheel. And the cops pulled up behind them, and both the little yep. boys jumped out the big wheel and ran into the house. And everybody making jokes and all that stuff is cool when they five and six. But then what happened when they 15 and 16 or when they 25 and 26? Is it still cute? It ain't cute then. So why are we embracing and endorsing that type of behavior? Um, you know, when they're young. Um, so I think the I agree with you. I think the programming um is there. I think there's a lot to go into that, but to keep from <laughs> getting long-winded, I'm I'm gonna yeah. go ahead and shut down here. But there, there's a lot. Like to me, the programming piece is a whole show uh, in and of in itself, itself. Yeah, that you know, we really need to dig uh deeper into. Because a lot of us don't even realize the different levels that it's operating on. You know, we we speaking, we were speaking earlier this week about a pro-black lady, a lady who said she was pro-black, but based the first half of her name off Greek mythology and the second half of her name off German uh German linguistics. And talking bad about black men. Right. And but, because but she's she, mad about her situation that she put herself in. And here's here's the flip side of that, right? Uh a lot of people will hear that and will say, yeah, but the Greeks got the knowledge from black people. So really, she's giving honor to black people. And to that, I would say, well, why didn't she use the African names that that it came from? Because right. the Africans didn't call her Aphrodite. You know what I'm saying? And, and you got no excuse for the German joint. <laughs> um, so you know what I'm saying, but that's that's the level of program we on where even when we get some information, we immediately try to shift it instead of changing the way we think and the way we do things, we try to fit it into the program. That's why you can have somebody say, I'm pro black this, I'm pro black that, but then also say, I'm a part of a Greek letter society that was basically modeled after white people that wouldn't let you in theirs. Hey, you know, that pro-black term is very loose these days. Yes, yeah, uh, it is weird. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say? I'm gonna, I'm gonna edit that out, Joe. I will. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, When I think about where we've devolved, and Amos Wilson was really good about talking about you can make progress, but you can also regress. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I think we hit that place in probably the late seventies, early eighties, when we started to regress culturally speaking. And it went from black people building businesses, communities, black people uh, being neighborly and friendly with one another. We actually had neighborhoods and we lost that with, you know, the advent of the crack cocaine era, Reaganomics and, and toward the late eighties before when the nineties came, that was the end of the neighborhood, end of the community, end of all those things. And this is one of those things again, whereas when black people were making progress, the war on drugs, was utilized to destabilize black communities. Um, and also what happened was we stopped progressing as a people, spiritually, uh, physically, mentally, we stopped, we started to regress. And our ideals went from nation building or community building to leisure, food, playtime, and overall embracing the toxic culture. And these are things that happen when you are, when you deal with mischievous children who have too much time on their hands and not enough responsibility. Not They don't understand what responsibility is. These are children that don't understand you need to take the trash out. You need to wash the dishes. You need to clean your bedroom. You need to make your bed. You know, the bathroom needs to be clean once or twice a week. You know, we don't have those things. And I'm speaking in general because what this really comes down to is arrested development. And damn, we just keep coming back to this, that we don't seem capable enough to accept our role in fixing what's wrong. And if we can't accept our role in fixing what's wrong, we'll consistently play around, muddle around in it all. And But we won't address the issues that, 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 that typically adults would address. So let's just make the black community one house. If there's a window that has cracked glass in it, as, a, an, as a, an adult, you would look and say, hmm, I, I need to fix that because a, a day when we have a stiff wind, that glass might break. But as a child, you look at it and then you'll continue to play your video games or continue to dance around the living room, run around, and you'll do things that actually make the damn glass break. You'll stomp, jump up and down, punch walls, and the glass will eventually break. And then we'll still look at the glass like somebody needs to clean that up. And we'll start dancing around that and playing around because that's what children do, especially irresponsible children. That's the nature of the black community right now, irresponsible children. And people might get offended by that, but you need to ask yourself, the conditions that we're in right now, if all the white people left, if the, all the white America decided to get up and go back to Europe or some up plunder some other place, they all got on spaceships and conquered Mars or some shit, where would black people be? How would we run and stock supermarkets? How would we handle the water supply and water distribution? How would we handle garbage collection? How would we handle the infrastructure of a society? We have to ask those questions because right now, all those things are being taken care of by our enemies. And we live comfortably in that, you know, in that situation. Yeah. You know, if, I was just going to say, if all white people chose to give up white supremacy and go back to Europe or whatever they want to do, they didn't want to do the white supremacy stuff no more because of the condition and the behaviors, the, the negative and, the, and degenerate behaviors that we've passed down from generation to, to generation. We're going to continue doing what we're doing. They can be absent for another 400 years. We're going to continue doing what we're doing because we haven't, like you said, we haven't done our part in changing was what happened to us because we, they can fix their part, but we don't fix our part. Nothing going to change. That's all I want to say, Pat, my bad. No, 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 you good. I was just going to say PC reminded me, um, because she talked about survival, and I think that's one mm -hmm. of the things uh, she talked about. Basic, you know, basic survival mode is being able to meet your needs, stay alive long yep. enough to create the next generation yep. and raise that generation. Um, <laughs> now, she didn't qualify raise that generation. She didn't qualify that with any standards 
are measures of success. She just said raise that generation. And I think if you look at the community right now, we are stuck. And PC, you've been saying this for years. Joe, you've been saying this for years. A lot of people have been saying this for years. We're stuck in survival mode. Yep. Um, even though we have all the tools to get out of survival mode, at this point, because of our superpower, our amazing adaptability, <laughs> we are comfortable in survival mode. We don't know how to function without the stress of super white supremacy, right. racism, white right. supremacy. Right. We don't know how to live life without somebody's boot on our neck. And that's proven the majority of the time. I'm not going to say every time. The majority of the time that we know of, when black people from the hood or from any lower uh, lower socioeconomic place in America comes into quick cash, there's always drama that comes with them. And they out. Right. How many of these young rappers been, and this ain't like no new occurrence. This has been happening for the last, you know, 20, 20, 20 years or so. Rapper blow up, boom, boom, boom. Like we ain't just talking about, you know, the dudes on the West Coast and whatnot. You know, he, Big L up in New York. That was the 90s. Um, You know, uh, Pac and Big, and they weren't the first ones. You know what I'm saying? We can go down the list. Nowadays, all these young these young dudes getting publicized for it, uh, and they ain't even really hitting no real level of fame yet. They getting taken out before they even really get a chance to bubble over. So, but we see this, all the athletes, how many of these athletes we see running the problems? They don't know, you You hear dudes, women and men talking all the time about how they need excitement and they need drama. They need this and all of that. This like, function is normal. Right. And that's, that's exactly what I'm getting at. Because we were created in an unnatural way as a people, I'm gonna keep mm -hmm. saying this. I don't give a damn who, mm -hmm. who feelings it hurt. Because we were created in an unnatural way for an unnatural purpose, and we continue to exist in an unnatural environment, we cannot allow our culture to develop naturally. It's not going to develop to our benefit. We have got to take active steps and become yep. active participants. In the yep. development of our culture, we can't do what other groups do where they just let culture happen. We nope. can't do that. Nope. We got mm -hmm. to step our game up or we're going to keep getting stepped on. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move forward. Okay, so that's what survival means. In order to be self autonomous, it means that the group has to have within its control the means to assure its survival. Yeah. All right. Can't depend on nobody else to do that. All right. That's not going to happen. That's not the way the world works. Now, what are the chief obstacles to survival? Okay. Let's just be real. What are they? One is nature. You've right. got to have within the means of the group some way for the group to survive earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, right. tornadoes, whatever. All right. right? So nature is one. Other men and women who might want to take your land, water, means of survival. All right. And yourself. All right. You can't become no cotton-picking drug addict, alcoholic, kill yourself. All right. right? Well, that's right. Okay. Those are the obstacles. Now... Stop the right culture. there. Mm -hmm. I just want to highlight that last point she said. We recognize the external threats to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Nature and competition with other humans. Mm -hmm. Hear what she said about you can't be no cop pick drug addict. Mm -hmm. I got news for y'all. Weed is a drug. That alters your state of mind. I don't give a damn if you like the way it alters your state of mind. You're not functioning at 100% capacity when you're in a state called high. I don't give a damn how you got there. You're not functioning at maximum capacity. And that's the truth we need to have. And I know a lot of people smoke weed. I'm not saying you need to give up weed altogether. I don't smoke weed, so I ain't trying to tell you what to do. I'm just trying to tell you that to a non-weed smoker, when you get high, you get stupid. That's that's what you get to me. 
you get stupid. So stop thinking that you deep and you can make these decisions. And look, I want to say 20% of the black community is walking around addicted to weed and don't even think, don't even believe you can be addicted to, to weed. But yes, you can. The studies show it. It's got an 8% addiction rating. Now, it's funny because not just we, alcohol, but some of right. us are addicted to bullshit. And <laughs> those addictions are just as bad because many people are in denial in terms of what they're actually addicted to or how that, that affliction is causing them. You know, people addicted to fashion, people addicted to drama, people addicted to, you know, uh, the the reality TV, you know, um, y- y- the 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 enemies we create and amongst ourselves, like you were just talking about the drill rap, Pat, you know, um, and she was speaking more so into survival. There's a television show that was out a while ago, about a year or two ago, uh, came up right around the time of the pandemic, the pandemic, as I call it. Uh, it's called Why the Last Man. And th- it was based on this comic strip that talked about some sort of affliction that was released in nature in which the male species of every, you know, uh, the male the male demographic of every species was affected and eventually killed off. And that there was like one male monkey and one man, and they were ruling, roaming about, and all these women were trying to capture them because they were looking to harness this dude to make children and all this other shit. But um, but what happened is the world went to chaos and turmoil because the women didn't know what the hell they were doing when it came to the leadership, um, in 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 the running of the utilities. The day to day, the day to day things that you need to to operate in a modern society, they just didn't have the skill set, the skill set, the know how, or the ability to make these decisions because they've never been in those places before. That's what we find ourselves at now. When she talks about survival, I go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm-hmm. and the basic tenets, the foundational tenets that you need to control in order to control your community: food security. Um, structure and a way to earn capital and then you need to be able to you know those are the foundational things we don't have that we don't have those things and we don't make it a priority to get those things we rather live you know our, our whole thing is now talking about you know this fantasy about this this lifestyle that's that's been falsely advertised on so through social media, excuse me, and um, through social media as well as reality TV, as we spoke of earlier. But yet and still, we're not dealing with the fact that the black and in, in the black community, both black men and black women, now average out to about forty two thousand dollars a year. So all these six figure cats and all these women looking for six figure guys. And all these women living these different lifestyles, and everybody makes six figures these days. But the stats say the average salary in the black community is forty-two thousand. Mm-hmm. We're not dealing with the reality or the harshness of our situation. Um, so I know we got more to review, so I'm gonna let this. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna say we surviving later on. We we surviving, man. What y'all talk, man? What y'all talking about? We surviving. Look. Isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it funny that the two groups of people in this country who were dominated by white supremacy have high rates of addiction? Isn't it funny? Survival. Survival. Isn't, isn't it funny? It's a real niche the two, the two groups of people in this country who are dominated by white people, they struggle with group unity. Because survival... Survival says, okay, well, for me to make it, I can't go with the group. Because if I go with the group, me as the individual can't make it. 
survival. When 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 we when we I think we need to break down uh we need to further break down survival and what survival is to us and how we survive and why we survive and why we do things that we do because what you what you all are saying is it's correct. We're a specific group of people with specific history and specific conditions. And we can't operate like any other group because our history is unlike any other group. And white supremacy is all we know. It's all we know. We we have only been dependent upon them for our survival. That's all we know. Especially like especially for the last 200 years. That's all we know is having white people run the society for us. And so, like, like both of you said earlier, let's just be real. Too many black people, probably the majority of black people, are afraid to take control because of the responsibility that would come with being autonomous. Mm -hmm. There's responsibility and autonomy. And I don't really believe the majority of black people want that because they found their comfortable place in white supremacy. And it's easier being comfortable in white supremacy than being autonomous. So, yeah. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> that we pass down from generation to generation is supposed to help the group to survive and to be self-autonomous. The major way that we pass this culture on is through what? Groups, family, right. church, right. school, right. organizations like this. All right. Those are the means. Okay, now, unfortunately. It's real quick. It's, a, it's another uh, blow against us because we, the nuclear family is not in abundance in our community. Um, there is family happening because uh, man, woman, and child is together. It's just not in the traditional sense. It's not in the marriage sense, but it's not in abundance. But it's, it's difficult to pass down a proper culture or positive culture, uplifting culture, empowering culture, family culture, especially when right now we don't have a premium on family. We really don't care about family. It's more about the individual and what, and basically we're at a me, 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 I, 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 me, 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 I, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want, and I'm going to do whatever I do to get to what I want, and then when I get to this point, bam, oh, well, I want to change something, but it's still what I want. It's never about us. And so, yeah, we can't pass down proper culture if we don't have the proper uh, uh, foundations or the proper institutions in place to pass down culture. I just want to say that. No, well, because real quick, well, it ain't going to be quick, but because that, that was where I was, that's where I wanted it stopped anyways, because she's talking, right now she, she just highlighted uh, a big part of culture and survival is passing stuff down. You're going to pass down the things that you feel like are necessary to survive. There are, they are key indicators of what your culture values. That's why people can look at black culture and make all kinds of assumptions about black people. Because typically you can do that with a group of people. You can look at how they move and make assumptions about how they grew up. Um, and the only thing we passing down is generational curses, both in the yeah. form of genetic and genetics and in the form of ways of thinking. And this is where we go back to what we were talking about earlier. Every single time a mass of black people laughs at and celebrates two five-year-olds jumping out of a power wheel and running from the cops, you're sending a clear message of what's acceptable. It's not just fun and games, and that's one of the things we got to get out of. You got to be intentional about what you're doing. Every when it's time to play games, even that has to be intentional. We're not in a place again where we can just do things naturally. Everything's got to be planned out in order for us to get out of the situation we in. And everything can't be a party, which is what you know, PCU say this all the time. We always want a fucking party. 
everything can't be a party. Everything can't be laughing and joking. If all we doing on TikTok is laughing and joking, guess what that says about our culture? Yeah. Hey. Yeah, you know, um, and it's and it's because we're not codified. Joe, you said you made mention of it earlier. What happened to black people wasn't natural. Our ascension into this country was not natural. The slave making colonies in Barbados were not natural. That's that you don't produce a natural functioning human being that way. You create, you modify, genetically modify people into becoming drones, slaves, and you know, to the point where they cannibalize off of one another. Our relationships with each other right now are transactional. What can we get out of this? Why should I invest in something? I need to see the fine print. I need to be, or I'll get you to invest and then you'll see, you know, I, I'm going to pick up and move on and go to the next town and you'll never see it here from me again. We have, we have not fortified a trustworthy culture built in um, loyalty, built in respect and built in integrity. We have not done those things. Um, they're, they're, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, it's real life. <laughs> uh, man, people, my phone rings all the time. I, I could have swore I had to um, volume all the way down, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my bad, man. Uh, so in regards to um, the way we function, we don't function like a people who actually have an identity. We function like a people in search of one. And, and we don't believe in each other to the point where we believe we can actually build one together. We don't even trust each other to build and work together. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic that more trust is given to the, the bastards that enslaved our ancestors and still benefit off of that system of white supremacy and white privilege than we give to one to one another is uh is a very inter interesting um way to function when you become not just you become willfully dependent on the warden of the prison that that imprisons you and not be able to work with the other inmates <laughs> if that makes any sense in order to form yeah. like a create a prison break we want to create a more comfortable situation within the prison, which is, is, is weird, but that's just how we move these days. It's easy because it's easier to do that. It's, it's less responsibility. I, I can operate as a child, but so the system is working perfectly. The plan, the conditioning, all of uh, everything white, the white supremacists put in place is working perfectly because if it wasn't working perfectly we wouldn't be having this conversation we will be having these issues arrested development within our culture is supposed to happen addiction within our culture is supposed to happen the breaking up of families in our culture is supposed to happen the killing of each other is supposed to happen because that's what they created us to do that's what they bred us to do that's what they conditioned us to do after after slavery when we were no longer the direct, uh, the the direct mass of the labor, like we were then, they had to find another way to make us the labor class. But also, we got too big, we got too uppity for ourselves. Them years after slavery, before Reconstruction, we got too big for ourselves. So they said, you know what? Never again, never again will we allow these Negroes to think that they can have some kind of power, some kind of place in this country. And guess what? They put all types of conditioning and legal things and just terrorism in place to teach us and make us into the destructive beings that we are to each other right now it was designed to be this way so like you keep saying because it was designed to be this way and i like what you said pat we every action and every thought everything that we do has to be intentional i know like for me every woman that i'm dating and uh, we're in a relationship and we're thinking about and it could possibly be somebody that I can move forward with or, or we possibly talk about making, maybe starting a family or something. I lay out my intentions from the beginning. One of the main reasons 
we I we have to have family and, and family. I want to make sure I build a family. It's because we got to pass down proper culture. We need families. We have to be intentional about reversing what happened to us, not just going along with the current. Because guess what? That ain't working for us. It stuff keep getting worse. But we got we have elders co-signing ratchet culture because they want to be cool, because they want to fit in, because they want the spotlight. Now we now let's just be real. Look, we saw Maxine Waters on national TV and all throughout the internet co-sign Megan the Stallion and Cardi B's WAP. Mm -hmm. A sad day in black culture when you have an elder co-signing ratchet behavior, destructive behavior. Because, mm -hmm. hey, and 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 if it was an elder black man co-signing one of these stupid male black rap sons, it would be the same. It would be the same. Our elders cannot be co-signing stupid behavior because they want to be popular or they want to fit in. They want to be, they want to be lit, whatever word the kids is using. No, no, there has to be somebody standing up saying, no, we cannot behave like this. We got to be better. But hell, if our elders, if our elders behave bad, we see social media. We know the elders we grew up with. The Medea character is real. That's based off of real behavior. All these, think about, think about how many black, elders black grandmothers going viral on TikTok and going viral on instagram and all these things for cussing not just cussing just having the five mouth and cussing and fighting and doing all this crazy ratchet stuff because it's funny the elders are not only indulging in ratchet behavior they passed it down and then they co-signing it yeah good luck black people but yeah so let's move forward for us, we live in a country where the overriding values of the country are against us. Mm -hmm. For instance, these overriding values put in the positions of privilege mm -hmm. people who are white, right. people who are male, mm -hmm. and people who are wealthy. Right. Now, the, the, the one thing I disagree with her about this is she's saying people were put in position of power. No. They took their position of power. I think we need to really, I think we need to say that and be honest with it. Nobody was put in position. They have the position they have because they took the power. I just want to say that. Right. And these three groups dominate the society. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about teaching our children instrumental values like equality, liberty, fraternity, etc. We are talking about ordering those values under the institutional values of race, gender, and wealth so that more white people get equality, liberty, and fraternity than black people, more men get equality, liberty, and fraternity than women, and more wealthy people get equality, liberty, and fraternity than poor people. You get it? All right. All right. All right. This doesn't do enough then, ladies and gentlemen, for us to teach our children about the instrumental values, you know, if we don't teach them the impact of the institutional values on the distribution of the latter. Otherwise, our kids don't get the full message and don't know how to behave. With power comes privilege. If you want privilege, you got to have power. And if you have no power, all you're going to do is complain about the privilege that you lack. And you have to deal with the scraps. You have to deal with the crumbs on the table if you choose not to become powerful, if you choose to remain subservient, if you choose to not stand up, if you choose to not be better, if you choose to embrace the, the worst of your culture, if you choose to keep reproducing with the worst of your culture, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. Black folk, stop complaining about, oh, it's the patriarchy, it's the system, it's all these things. It's this, stop complaining about something that you ain't going to do nothing about. Don't nobody give a damn. Nobody gives a damn about you complaining because you ain't going to do nothing about it. You sound stupid, black folk. We look stupid out here complaining about something that everybody know we ain't going to do nothing about. Pat, we got two superpowers, remember.
adaptability and talking shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's um it's it's what 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 I heard her say and it, when I heard her mention the gender part, it took me back to once again um the great Dr. Tommy J. Curry in his book The Man Not where they identified white male patriarchy and white supremacy and white women post-Civil War, post the first Civil Rights Act that established black men as having power, the power to vote, the power to uh, own property, the power to uh, run for public office, et cetera, et cetera. White women took that power. White women organized. And then when white women didn't have enough numbers, white women enlisted black women to help them to gain those powers because they wanted to be, e they wanted to have equal opportunity in regards to sharing in white privilege, sharing in the patriarchy. So to go back to what you just said, Joe, power begets power. Power doesn't yield to beggars. If we want power, we must take power. And, you know, I realized that less than one tenth of one percent of black people actually want real power in this country. When we produced the Independence Day Project, the film, which actually gave step by step dynamics to how we can actually gain power. It was one of the few documentaries I've ever seen that does not lay the abilities of black people, black people's abilities to gain power at the behest of anybody else but ourselves. And when I realized that when people saw that, that saw that film and, and understood that we would have to be autonomous, we would have to be responsible, and that we would actually have to take this on ourselves if we followed the blueprints that were put out by that film, what I realized is the majority of us, just like Pat said, talk a lot of shit. And we want to actually gaslight somebody else to do the work that's beholden to us to do in regards to regaining our power to regain to to gaining our autonomy and to you know um develop a culture of self self-reliance and self-responsibility yeah i ain't got nothing to add after all that so we keep it moving <laughs> that was the end of the end of the the um the clip but I, look, um, if you want to be respected, like you said, power begets power. We are not, we, we keep saying this. We are not respected because we don't even work to fix our own and uplift our own. Like, I'm the passport bros and the divestors, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm concentrating on me. I love black women. I think black people should be together. But I do think those are bad looks for us internally and externally because it's shown that we've gotten to a point where we can't stand each other so much that we're literally like almost begging other groups of people to be with us. Of course, one group, uh, one one gender has a bit of a uh, edge over the other gender, but it's because of the behavior. It's because of the behavior, though, the behavior that we have towards each other. And now we feel like, well, I can't get along with somebody of my own race. So because I can't get along with somebody of my own race, I will go and seek somebody else. I'm pro black. I'm pro black. But. I want to be with somebody else. And a part of me is like, I think a lot of y'all are quitters. But then <laughs> another part of me is, well, choose better as well. Like your vetting process has to be better. Also, the people who you attract. So you got, I mean, you got to look at you too. Now, of course, I don't have all the answers. And hell, you ain't got to listen to me. I might not even be right. But all I'm saying is when you have, when, and when our internal strifes are on full display for the rest of the world because we've gotten to a point where we just don't 
care about each other no more. We just don't give a damn about each other no more like that. The way we treat each other, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in if we actually treated each other better. We can, we can, we can actually look back at a time in Black American history where we treated each other better. That's why we are doing what we're doing because we know this behavior, these behavior patterns are new. They can be changed, but we have to want to change them. Mm. That that's yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, you know, go back to that whole concept of being stubborn. Be, to be stubborn, to be petty, all those things are childish traits. Yeah, you know, we we don't want to grow up. We want to be Toys of Us kids for the rest of our lives, uh, and. When it comes to survival, we're cool. We, you know, we're like the homeless kids that find a way to sneak into the convenience store to grab some burritos and sneak shit out the snack machine and things of that nature. And we'll we're comfortable with sleeping on the vents on the corner or sleeping at a bus stop on a bench or you know finding you know a corner in the park with a blanket or some shit. We're not we're not ready. To And I don't know what it's going to take to get us ready. I think that we really do have to look into the, the, the biochemical war that's been taking place. Because there's some there's a lot to what happened to the minds of black people to the point where we're not moving as a people who should feel threatened right now. Literally, our, our existence is being threatened right now. If white supremacy was an asteroid, it would be heading towards every black community and we would call it an extinction level event on the horizon. We must do something about it. We must find a way to deflect this asteroid, destroy this asteroid, or to prepare for a life that can actually take on the impact of the asteroid or the, the comet or whatever. We see it and we're in the gates. We're looking at the shit from a gaze like we're fascinated by this ball, <laughs> this ball of fire that's headed towards us. You know, uh, we're stargazing right now and we're actually looking at the shit like it's party lights. You know, <laughs> like we're dancing to it. It's uh, it, it's it's something where. And, and it goes back to something Marcus Garvey said, you can't take everybody that's black back to Africa because some people are no good here. It gets to a point where you have to start looking at who is ready to move on and who are we going to allow nature to take on this natural evolutionary curse. I mean, course of eliminating those who aren't ready to progress to past this place of survival. Because contrary to popular belief, a lot of people understand you can become extinct as a race. And that's something we don't really seem to take seriously. And we hope that somebody else swoops in and saves us. When we look around the room, ain't nobody going to save us but us. Yeah. I think we just too selfish on that tip. This uh, YOLO lifestyle, the, the I know culture. Um, we're, we're too, I, I think a good chunk of us again stuck in that survival mentality that survivalist mentality mindset we don't care we just as long as we can get ours and have some fun before we go we cool um and i think that's the piece we're struggling with and I, to me the most difficult part of all of this is identifying the chameleons um those people that's trying to play both sides of the fence you know those you know people that are. Those people that are trying to, they want to hedge their bets. They want to gamble on blackness, but they want to have some stock in whiteness just in case mm -hmm. the blackness don't work out. Um, and those those people are in abundance. And I think the, the numbers of those people are growing because those are the people that won't take any real rest, risk with anything. You know, they, they, they'll talk behind an alias or a, a profile picture. Um, but when it's time to do something real, you know, um, you know, they kid got a birthday party to go to. <laughs> hey, how many, how many times 
<laughs> did we encounter that? And it's funny that you say that because he's he's saying that from actual experience that we've had year after year after year after year. When is people like you said, people will be there for the planning and the early planning, but when it's time to put boots on the ground, pro black people get they, their personal life get real busy. Mm -hmm. And, and it, but but <clears throat> and it's funny, but <laughs> we have to take corrective action we have to make sure that we're improving ourselves in our personal life if your if your life isn't getting better on the individual or family level you got work to do you got work to do you have to be better for the whole to be better you mm -hmm. have to if you have things that you that you're working on get the resources that you need to work on them right if you if you if you have relationships you need to repair repair those relationships you got you got careers and stuff you pursuing whatever you're doing as black people we have to be the best we have to be the greatest versions of ourselves we can't afford to be half assing especially if you're one of the ones who consider yourself as a as an intelligent being a conscious person an awakened person who know what's going on who's supposed to know better well damn it we got to do better we have to be better people. We can't. Our everyday actions cannot contribute to our destruction. And if they are, then we got work to do. Now, I'm saying that not, and we come. We're not coming from a place of perfection. We got work to do too. We got motherfucking work to do. The three of us, we got work to do. We ain't perfect. We in the same boat with you all. We rowing right next to you. We sweating. We smell the seawater. We up and down. We right next to you. We just talking. We just the vocal ones about it. We the ones that make this trying to help make sure that we can get to where we go. That's but but you have to be your best. I have to be my best. PC, you got to be your best. Pat, you got to be your best. All of us have to be our best. And if we're not working to improve ourselves, our communities, our families, we will never get to a point to where we are powerful, respected group of people, and it, it's just gonna continue to get worse. You know the bad part about that, and I hate to always seem like I'm a pessimist, but I think I'm a realist. The bad part about that is everybody that's watching this video is going to assume that they're the exception to what you just said. Everybody's going to assume that they're the ones doing it right, and it's everybody else that's fucking up. And the bob the bad part is is listen, um, and I think we touched on it last week. None of us are doing enough to to get past this place of survival. None of us. None of us are doing enough to get, if you're not working with a, a, a cohort of people and you're not building something that's sustainable, you know, and I don't, we don't need to hear about it. It doesn't need to be this big fancy promotion on social media, anything of that nature, but you'll see the difference in the community. If we're not seeing that, then it's not enough because you know, we always talk about tangibles. But every time I hear people talk, it's more like, uh, <laughs> uh, what is it called? It's like, uh, what, I forget the name of it, but it's more like, you know, well, well listen, I gave it to go, oh, try. You know, I gave it to college, try. You know, uh, and, Keep trying. and, and we're, we're settling for moral victories. And moral victories ain't going to get the job done. Shit. You know, if we're not actually willing to do better for the sake of our children, oh, I don't know what else that. could motivate you. I don't know what else we could do to motivate anybody. And these people don't care about their kids. I ain't saying all along, but a lot of people, man, if these people, if, if a lot of these people care about their kids, their children wouldn't live in, in the conditions they live in. Their kids wouldn't be subjected to the trauma and the craziness that they subjected to. Hey, man, a lot of these people don't care about their kids, man. These kids are accessories to a lot of these people, and that's the problem. Within our community, black people, too many black people, not all, but too many black people have made their children accessories rather than looking at them as human beings that need to be productive, that need to be good, genuine human beings to carry on positive culture. Yeah, I hear you. I'm with you. But really, being 
being hitting yeah, the, uh, I hitting the realism volleyball. Yeah, back. yeah, these, these yeah. people don't really care. <laughs> kids have become a uh, come on, man. Kids have become want to be friends of, with their kids. Yeah, kids have become proof of adulthood more yeah. so than than seeds of the future nowadays. Like, I was just having this conversation um, about how. You know, I was talking to somebody, and I know this might offend a lot of people, but, you know, I'm, I'm on record as doing that already a bunch during the series. So, um, but they was, I was like, there's no reason for anybody to have three full-time jobs. And they was like, well, hold on, Pat. Like, but, you know, if you got kids, and I was like, if you need three full-time jobs to raise your kids, you shouldn't have them. You fucking up somewhere. You ain't got time to raise the kid with three full-time jobs. In addition to that, if you have three full-time jobs, to me that says you're trying to live outside of your means. So you're not passing on good financial advice to the kid. And I'm not talking about you got a full-time job, a part-time job, and a bunch of little side hustles. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about you got three full-time jobs. There's no excuse for it. None whatsoever. And if you got kids, I can automatically call you a bad parent because it, it it ain't too many more waking hours than 120 hours in a week. It ain't a whole lot of time you got left to actually raise this kid. And the reason I say it might offend some people is because uh, the person I was talking to knows a lot of people that have multiple full-time jobs. And they have children. So, in effect, I was calling them bad parents. And I stand on what I said. If you are an adult with kids and you got multiple full-time jobs, you're a failing as a parent. I, 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 give them a caveat of, of why you can say that in your experience as a parent. So, just give them that real quick. Oh, yeah. I can say that because I've been a single dad of three boys, three ba young baby boys. Uh working a full-time job, going to school full-time, and having a part-time job and a part-time hustle, running a business full-time. It's not a lot of time left to be a good parent. It's not. Mm -hmm. And while I made a lot of money during those years, and I did manage to raise three well-behaved boys, I can say that I was not the best parent I could be because I was tired and I was gone. So, you know, I'm speaking, I'm not just attacking people to attack them from a position of being high and mighty. Like, this is like lived experience. Something that our elders should be sharing it with us. You know, they should be telling us these things because I know a lot of our elders worked a lot and didn't have a lot of time to spend with their kids, which is why we ended up fucked up like we are. But don't right. nobody want to wear that helmet. No, wanna nobody want to put what on I didn't that have. hat. Right. Well, let's keep kids. What I didn't have. Yeah. yeah, everybody talking about what their kids didn't have. What about what your kid? What about what about what you did have? Mm -hmm. you, you, you turned got out discipline. well. You got I never respect. understood that. You got work you, ethic. You turned out good, but you the 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 programming you was given helped you be a solid individual. But you gave your child something less than what you had because you focused on the material things and not yeah. on. That not on the the love, not on the structure, not on the discipline, not on the the qualities and the values. You focus on the material things. We were poor. We were poor. We don't want to be poor no more. But you turned out to be a damn good person. Though. But it, it shows how warped everything is, because you didn't have a lot of materials. But in a lot of cases, we got a lot of time, and so we we think that the opposite is better. Instead of yep. giving our kids time, we give them all the materials we didn't have. And then we ask, why did they grow up entitled and selfish and spoiled? And Because the parents made them like that. Well, when you look at it, these a lot of people grew up resenting their parents for the fact that a lot of their friends had more freedoms or, or would look to be freedoms, but more so was just they were just the results of irresponsible parents themselves. So a lot of the people grew up talking about, I'm going to give my child this. I'm going to be best friends. And, and look how that shit turned out. Look how it's turning out. Uh, we, we, we Accountability. Accountability is lacking. And we don't have that. You know, a lot of people criticize Dr. King because they, you know, there's nonviolence, civil disobedience, 
methods that he used during the Civil War and I mean, excuse me, <laughs> the Civil Rights Movement. <laughs> Shit, we're still dealing with the Civil War, but uh, Dr. King went into um, Harry Belafonte's house in 1968, right before he died, and made an admission of, you know, uh, he was account. He was trying to be accountable for the fact that he said he thought he brought his people into a burning house. That's a huge admission to saying, as a 39-year-old man, yo, I fucked up. I need to write in this, which, by the way, was one of the things that actually him trying to be accountable to the people was one, one of the methods that they actually utilized to kill him. But the point of the matter is he acknowledged after years and years and years, almost two decades, of leading black people a certain way that he made a mistake and that he needed to write in the ship. Now it's truly unfortunate that he didn't get a chance to rectify that mistake by living past that 10 days of 38, 39. But the bottom line is he recognized the error in his ways and he was willing to change. When are we as black people going to realize the error in our ways, the way we treat our women, the way our women treat our men, the way we disregard the children, the way we disrespect the elders, the way the elders don't hold us accountable anymore because they're afraid of losing our affection instead of just staying firm and saying this shit needs to stop. At some point, we need to get to that place where we look in the mirror and say, yeah, I fucked up. Let me fix this. Let me do the adult thing and fix what's wrong. I built this house on a shaky foundation. Let me knock this house down and then we can all start anew. Um, I can't build this house by myself. Let me go see who I can work with and let's build this house together. Let them help me build my house. I'm going to help them build their house. We're going to build these houses and these communities together. We're going to involve our children. We're going to make sure that the elders are taken care of. We're going to make sure that the women and children are protected. The women are going to make sure that we're well fed and stocked. Things of that nature. The children are going to be good you know, uh, stewards to the Jagnus in our community. When are we, you know, those are things, places we need to get real conversations because a lot of us want to be the who's who of black history and things of that nature. None of that shit matters because all the people that actually really made a difference in the past, they didn't know one quintilla of what we know right now. And yet and still they were able to make a, dif a difference and we're actually talking about them right now. When do we get to that place? Instead of just having, you know, uh, I, I might want to say it right now, but when do we get to that place? Hey, I made him say Quintilla, so you know you got he on it. You know <laughs> Shout out to Quintilla and her home and her brother. We went to high school together. Nah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. If somebody yeah. named Quintilla, like that's what's up. That's that's love. Yeah. <laughs> hey man, look, ain't no no need to beat a dead horse. But the the thing is, we either gonna get better or we gonna die off, and we not gonna be. We're gonna be such a small. Uh, the numbers gonna be so small and so ineffective that we're not really gonna matter anymore. So if that's the future y'all want, go ahead. But we're gonna keep over here working. You know, on your everyday life, do what you got to do to make yourself better, make your community better. Get out whatever skills, uh, whatever skills you have, whatever talents you have, whatever you can do. If you dance, go show some black kids how to dance, and in the process, help them see some other things. An example, uh, I'm. Mentor Keith Turner, we were like when I was in elementary school, we were at an after school program in the middle of the hood. And it was only a matter of time for we'd be fighting and doing all other stuff, too. So he started a drill team, just a simple drill team teaching us how to march and, and do drills like the military. But that drill, us being in that drill team kept us away from a lot of the fighting and a lot of the, of the drama and the violence that was happening at the community center or the after school program that we was at. And being able to see, we were able to see something different. That's that's an example. He didn't he didn't have to. He wasn't trying to change the world. All he did he he used the skill sets that he had, and that impacted our lives. And that has that that happened when I was like eight years old. I'm, it's thirty years later, and it still has had an impact. Just start with where you are. If you can draw, just teach people how to draw. If you want to, you can make cotton candy. Teach kids how to make cotton candy and sell it. A black business. Just start somewhere. We got to start with improving. And if we don't, it's our fault when we don't exist like we want to exist. 
So, yeah. uh, Joe, I hate to rain on your parade, but if don't teach them how to sell cotton candy, we we got a weight problem in the community. <laughs> Thank you, Technical Ted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. He had to show up. I, I, the show was almost over, but he here one time for Ted. <laughs> hey, man. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to the homie Larry. Um, appreciate you for reaching out to me. We, we've been able to connect. So shout out to to the to my homie Larry. Um, I appreciate all the comments. I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate all the love that people are giving. Remember my birthday Saturday, so y'all give me some shout outs on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Turned thirty nine, so it's all. I know I'm lucky, but you know, drink water, drink water, take your seat moss. But www.ontheshoulderswind.com. Um, if you want to support me, that information is in the description. Uh, remember this upcoming week, this upcoming Monday. We will be starting reading a new book right now. The ISIS paper is leading. Um, you know, it's MLK weekend this Monday. Um, be, the, be the best version of black that you can be. The man didn't die for nothing. Be the best version of black that you can be. Professor Carl Tone Jones, uh, Patrick Irvin. Oh, and next week, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Next week, we're going to be breaking down parts of uh, Professor Carl Tone Jones' documentary, The Independence Day Project. So y'all go ahead and stick around for that because he got... There's a lot of information in there that's going that's that's really needed. So we're gonna be breaking down a clip from that. And because it's professor's video, we can actually show the video clip and it's gonna make it live. So we're gonna run that next week. But I love you all. Make sure y'all catch this next video. Peace out.